but it's created a different space for me to act in a visionary role, which doesn't necessarily have a beginning and the end. It's kind of like a big ball of yarn that just continues forever. Now, like I'm going to set two hours on Tuesday morning and then the vision will be done. Like the vision changes every single time I speak to somebody, it changes just a little bit. <laughs> I don't need to integrate every single idea he has all the time. Sometimes he just has ideas and he needs to say them and I need to give him space to say them. Let my subconscious hang out with them. And then there's going to be one or two that I say, okay, I see it. I got to see, I call them lily pads, right? So like, I don't want to not say no to an idea. I just can't quite see the lily pads yet. So the minute I can see the lily pads, it's the minute I'm like, okay, let's dig into this and figure out what this means and how this might impact the company in a bigger way. Okay, so today we have Mike and Carrie. I have met them through the Entrepreneurs Organization. And something I love about EO is that it really helps you scale trust. And in the visionary and integrator dynamic, that's critical. So I'm eager to have a conversation with these two about how they forge their visionary integrator relationship and what that journey looked like. And at the tail end of this, we'll talk about what they do and how you can connect with them. But I'd love to kick it off and start with, you both clearly have business. So at what point in your either childhood, work situation, did you realize that you were meant to be an entrepreneur or to create something out of nothing? What did that journey look like for you, individually and collectively? I went to school for photography. Mm -hmm. And as a photographer, you generally need to strike out on your own, start your own business. And when I was working... I was interning the summer of freshman year for a fashion photographer in Philadelphia. And so I paid close attention to the fact that he was running a business. Hmm. And I didn't really realize it at the time. It didn't really like dawn on me that it's like an entrepreneurial thing. I just felt like a photographer, run a business. That's what you do. But then I really wanted to live in New York. It was the dream. And so to do that, I had to get a grown-up job. And so my uncle got me into media planning for Universal McCann in New York City. And so that's when I joined the, a bigger organization and realized, oh, I don't have to run a business. This is glorious. <laughs> it wasn't until having been in, you know, done the media planning for a couple of years, I went from New York to Seattle. It's where I met Mike. And once I got married, my husband was an engineer and he was doing really well. And there, was this opportunity for me to strike out on my own with Mike and start this company. And I don't know that I would have made the leap had it not been for my husband who had started companies in the past himself. So he had a good entrepreneurial mind about him, uh, himself. And then he also was my, was sort of that fallback of like, if mm -hmm. anything goes wrong, I'm going to be okay. Mm -hmm. It was just some comfort in that. I didn't have that when I was starting thinking about starting a photography business. I was like, I have student loans to pay. I'm going <laughs> to have an apartment. I'm going to have all these bills. This is, I, I need a job. I need, I need to be a grown up. So. Yeah. I think this is so important because not all entrepreneurs are created equally. Like we think they say that saying that entrepreneurs are the people who will jump out of a plane and build their parachute on their way down. But not all of us are wired like that. Some of us do need to have a fallback plan to have the calmness within ourselves to be able to excel when we do start it. So your self-awareness along that journey seems to have evolved as well, in addition to the business side of it. How about for you, Mike? Yeah, I, growing up, had you know the lemonade stand on the corner and you know I'd, I'd wash cars and get yelled at by guys because I wasn't using the chamois right I, I'm not sure that I would call that being entrepreneurial I think it was just more like making a little bit of money to go to the movies but growing up you know what comes to mind is I didn't quite realize it but I was surrounded by many entrepreneurs um, so for example my best friend who lived around the corner, his dad started and sold two marketing agencies, one to Sir Martin Sorrell, who's like a famous guy in the ad world over in uh, globally, but you know, he's, he's does most of his work over in England. It was just like, that was just Mr. Hammerquist. That was just a guy who went to work and they always had Mac, like the big Mac, you know, the, the ones with the colors on the back before anybody else did. So I didn't know what they did, but I was like, they have like the cool computer. 
and our family still put like the tablecloth over the computer at the end of the day, you know, like, cause you, you don't look at that ugly monitor. So I had those examples in my life and I didn't even realize what was happening. And like my uncle, you know, in Minneapolis ran a law firm, right? No idea. My other uncle also in Minneapolis is a trial attorney, ran his own, you know, trial attorney practice. To me, it was just like, this is just what they do. And I share these stories because when it came time for us to start MKG marketing, I, I don't know that I, I would have launched into it if I hadn't had some of those examples around me. Even though I, I didn't have quite the awareness of what was happening there, I was still like, that's Uncle Paul, like that's Uncle Rod, like that's Mr. Hammerquist. Like these are people in my life that I, I see them doing these type of entrepreneurial things, even though I can't quite name it. Cause I just didn't even, I didn't have the language at that point. It was just like, that's just what they do. Like Uncle Rod goes to court. Like that's where work is. Like he goes to trial. Like yeah. I have no concept of what happens around that, but I know that that's where work happened for Uncle Rod. Yeah. Yeah. And when you saw them doing that, was it something that you admired or was it just a no? I I don't think I admired much except for again, they had the cool Max at my friend's, <laughs> you know, house around the corner and like we didn't we didn't have those cool ones at my house. I think I had, I didn't even realize it. It was just like these are people around me. And it wasn't I didn't have some awareness of that until probably Carrie and I really started getting serious about starting MKG marketing. And then, you know, about eight years ago, I was volunteering as an entrepreneur in residence at a group called the Idea Village here in New Orleans. And somebody came in and they actually said they were pitching to be an accelerator company. And they said, people that come from my background and that look like me, I don't know any of us who start companies. Mm -hmm. And like, I had this moment hearing that where I was just like, huh, like I've known people that look, look like me and don't look like me that have started companies, but I, like, I'm, I'm surround, like that's part of my life. Yeah. And this woman who is incredibly, the idea was terrible, but she was great. We almost actually brought her into the accelerator because we're like, she's awesome and she can make anything work, but the idea, idea was very bad. It, it needed a lot of love and she just wasn't ready for an accelerator yet. But having that experience, it was just kind of known using your language states. Like it was just like, this is kind of around me, even though I can't quite put my finger on it until later in life when I could actually like label it and understand what it was. Yeah. I have a similar story because my grandfather built a company to take public and my other grandfather had a successful insurance company and my father had a successful business. And so I watched entrepreneurship around me and my journey was organic. I didn't really think I wanted to do it. I fell into it. And so I feel like so many entrepreneurs, they, they pursue it differently. And then it's like, I've got something here. This idea is taking shape and then scaling. It's like, okay, now all the customers are coming. I've got all of the operational chaos. I've got structure and systems and hiring. And how do I do this all and not lose my sanity? In my experience, it's finding that visionary integrator relationship that is just magical. And so I want to see how did you guys meet? How did you know you trusted yourself enough, each other enough, and yourself enough, really, to forge a partnership? Because partnerships can go south too. So how did that evolve? This is a retrospective right here. I don't know that we've ever, I don't, I, mean, I don't know I that know. I've ever thought about it this way. So we met at our previous agency many moons ago, 20, 2010, 2011. The, the name, I'm not making this up, was called Wong Duty. I blush even just saying it out loud. <laughs> Probably their intention. It's very memorable. Good on them. But they were a creative agency who happened to have media planners in house <laughs> for me and Mike. So because it was just the two of us, I think we just formed a bond very quickly on how to approach each client. I mean, everything, every campaign was a dual effort. We were working on everything side by side. I remember even when I, we interviewed, I, we just had, we just got along. It was like, yeah, this is going to be a really good working relationship. I can, I can see this. This is going to be awesome. He was one of the reasons why I actually left. I was at MEC working on the Microsoft account and they had a recruiter headhunt me to come to Wong Duty. And I was really on the fence about it because I was, I was living the life. It's been a pretty cushy job. I was, didn't want to rock the boat, but 
between Mike and then somebody else at, at the company, a good friend of ours now, Steve Kesselman, I was like, these are really great, smart people who are going to push me and elevate me. And I, mm-hmm. I'm ready for that. So mm-hmm. yeah, so I think right out of the gate, when I met Mike, I was like, this is going to be good. And then we just formed a partnership both in like building ideas together and also being like, this is so frustrating. Like, <laughs> and it was out of that frustration. I believe that, you know, MKG really was born and we'd, you know, go on these really lovely walks together to go get lunch. And we would just like sort of scheme. <laughs> so I think it was just through the ideation of it that we were like, yeah, I, this feels good. I, I, we could go do this thing. I, I'm curious to hear Mike's side of the story. For me, it was definitely more of a gut feeling. Like, mm-hmm. no, I'm, I can, I can see this. I can feel this being like a good partnership. And mm-hmm. yeah, let's let's do this thing. I am curious about Mike's perspective, and then I've got questions. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. I feel like you're like separating us and like deposing us in different rooms. And, like, don't, don't let the two parties hear one another speak. Yeah. So how did we get together? You know, like Carrie mentioned, she was headhunted to to come over to Wong Duty, which is two people's names, by the way, to get that context. Tracy Wong and Pat Duty, both are men. I bring that up because we had a lot of people interview there and they're like, what's Tracy like? Is she nice? And I'm like, well, she's kind of a guy. So you probably should figure that out before you interview with her <laughs> or with him. Yeah. You know, I... I remember Carrie coming in, and I think Carrie will remember this too. We'll we'll see. I was just like cooked. Like I, you know, we we didn't have anybody in charge of that department. Seattle, where we were working, is a very kind of laid back place. But I was in like I was wearing a lot of sweatpants to work, and like nobody was saying anything because they're like, if he just keeps coming to work, just don't worry about like his appearance. But you know, you can start to tell outwardly, like, how is somebody, what is their body language like? How do they dress? You know, how, how are they showing up to certain things? And I was showing up as, as my friend Chris likes to say, as the horse, you remember from Animal Farm, right? Like, you know, this, this thing happens, don't worry, you know, boxer, the horse will work harder, right? This thing happened, no big deal. Boxer, the horse will work harder until boxer gets sold to the glue factory and the boxer becomes no more. And so I was on a, a path of boxer, the horse of just like, whatever, like, I'll just, I'll just keep working hard, hard, you know, I, I can do more, like, I can do more. Mm-hmm. Um, and Carrie came in and really helped to, not just for the department, but for me, like, kind of take a step back and understand, like, you're on an interesting path here. And I won't stop you if you really want to go down it. But this is kind of like, just objectively, like, for, for a fresh set of eyes, like, this is kind of where you're headed to. So just bringing some awareness to that mm-hmm. fact. And you know, I, I wish that we had like this, you know, like a Hewlett Packard style story of like we were in the garage tinkering, but like Carrie said, you know, we, we really just kept talking as we were working through different client accounts. We were like, this is how I wish we really were doing this, but we weren't in a position to change that at that agency. It wasn't a bad thing. It it just, it was our reality in that environment. And so for us, you know, we got to that point of like, well, what if we did do our own thing? And I remember I put up, I was like on a Friday evening or Saturday morning, like I put up a little two page WordPress website, which our boss immediately found. I'm not sure how uh, he immediately found and was like, Hey man, like we need to talk about this probably because it surprised the heck out of him. Cause he thought that we both worked for long duty at the moment. And he was like, what's going on here? Well, and his horse um, got ready to take off. So he's like, wait a minute, get my horse back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's like, the box has got to come back. And and that's really like where we started. And, and as I finish my, you know, my recollection of the story, we time boxed it. You know, we just said, let's try this for six months. I worked nights and weekends. Carrie, you know, went full time immediately into MKG marketing. And we just said, let's try it for six months, right? If we can't get a client engagement at that point, no harm, no foul, you know, no blood, no foul. Like it, it was, it was a great, it was a great try. And so that's how we kind of framed it, right? Is, is we're going to time box this. We're going to have some structure. We're going to have a clear measure of success, which means one paying client. Uh, there wasn't, notice there wasn't an amount of money being paid. It was just somebody has to pay us, right? That shows that we, we have established a little bit of a, a corner. Uh, in the world, and somebody will pay us to 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 continue working. Mm-hmm. And I think the other thing we did, which is interesting in the early days, is uh, the very first thing we did actually was I remember this. It was in my Bellevue apartment. Mike came over, and we sat down and did a what was it called? It was like where you it was like a formation agreement. 
and we like really sat down and said like okay if we're going to do this thing like what does this mean to us and what do we want out of it and like what's important and we laid it all out there i think that was so key like i was like i want a family i want to have kids someday i want to make sure i have time for them that's really important to me and like laid out what was important to him and we respect each other for that and i think that was a really key piece to us feeling like we're all in at that point like yeah we're good here um I want to go in so many different directions right now. So I'm going to just box a couple. Since the audience is going to be people who are a little bit deeper in their journey in scaling their organizations, I'm going to box the part about testing before you launch full steam into entrepreneurship. And I feel like you guys captured that so well, because that's what I did. That's what a lot of entrepreneurs do. If you don't have a paying customer, you don't have a business. So get your one paying customer and get that going. I think where scaling becomes really challenging is, Carrie, what you just did is what is the vision up front? Like, and what are we willing to trade or sacrifice to get it? And what are we not willing to trade or sacrifice to get it? And then also the mutual respect. I am hearing so much mutual respect between you two of knowing your individual strengths and also knowing the individual maybe struggles or challenges, but the compassion for each other that, hey, it's okay if you're nose to the grindstone, head down, and you don't see the forest for the trees. I got you there and vice versa. So how do you guys you're kind of operating like co-visionary, co-integrator. How do you delineate your lanes and own them so you don't step on each other's toes or get into kind of below the line conversations, blame game, all, all that stuff that can can happen in visionary integrator relationships. So I, I'm Carrie smirking, so I feel like I'm either hitting something hard here or I hey. feel like you read our story somewhere or this is written down or you were a fly on the wall through <laughs> the last 12 years. We hit all those things. We were definitely sharing the seat. We were sharing the integrator seat for a long time. We didn't know it. So what happened was we were both doing everything. That's just what you do, right? When you first start off, you're, you're both doing everything. We were showing up to client pitches together. We were putting presentations together. We were working on all the accounts together. We brought in, you know, as we were hiring, we were still like account managing them and the analytics piece. And like, we were still very much working in the business together on everything. And so when it came time to like figure out finance stuff or figure out marketing or figure out, you know, the IT side of things, we were still doing it all together. And then I decided to go have children. And when I came back, it was, I, you know, Mike held up the fort for two and a half months or so while I had twins. Um, and I came back and he, we had a, a super tough conversation and a strong heart to heart of like, one person cannot all do this. And we've been doing everything. And so like, where are we going from here? It was at that point that we split the roles and responsibilities based off of just our our own capability of like, to your point, like you said, Stacey, of like where our strengths were. And so Mike's strength was 100% sales. I came back. It was like the best problem to have coming off of maternity leave. We had way too much business, not enough people. Like, great problem to have. Oh, we were swimming in it. So I was like, Mike, you guys got the sales path. You're crushing it. And I said, I need to take the operations side and the people side because I got to go figure out like where people are going to come from to go staff. And then you take sales and I'll take marketing and then the finance piece as well. We sort of just like split the house, <laughs> divided it down the center. And that worked for a while. It worked from 2015 to 2021. 21-ish, yeah. 21-ish. And then we had a new heart to heart. And I'm going to let Mike take it from here because he sort of sparked the the ch the switch chains in the winds. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Stacey, you definitely are noticing some of the co coness of the role with an integrator and visionary amongst Carrie and I. And you know where where we were in about 2021 is I was actually talking to an EOS coach or an implementer, whatever they call them, an EOS implementation coach, and he was just asking some questions and he hadn't even hired him yet. And he said, the more you tell me, the more I realize you're actually both sharing these seats on your accountability chart. Like, I'm not sure if you're aware of that, but you are. And it was kind of an aha moment for me where I was like, oh, well, 
Yeah. I mean, I guess like I have been managing finance, but also big relationships and vision and those like I'm fine doing finance, but it's not like a, it's not a life giving activity for me. Like I do it because I need to, because it's my responsibility as a business owner to understand what's happening here. Um, But it's not like what I really enjoy with, you know, big relationships and vision and, and that kind of work. And so that conversation with Matt, you know, brought about our conversation where I said, Hey, I think we need to have another understanding of like, we really were just picking up things based on who had time. Like, Oh, well, Stacy's got an extra two hours in her week. So she can just do like the finance stuff. Cause it takes about two hours a week. Perfect. But it's not actually what Stacy should be doing or, or mm-hmm. Mike or Carrie in this case. And so in 2021, we had that conversation we split and we really focused on integrator visionary who does what there's still a little bit of crossover because as integrator and C- Carrie also carries the CEO title, which is not always common for an integrator to have that title. And so like she is involved with some big relationships because she has to be right as CEO. She has to understand like where certain things are, but it's created a different space for me to act in a visionary role, which as you probably know, Stacy doesn't necessarily have a beginning in the end. It's kind of like a big ball of yarn that just continues forever. You know, it's not like I'm going to set two hours on Tuesday morning and then the vision will be done. It, like the vision changes every single time I speak to somebody, it changes just a little bit. <laughs> I joke. I have built several multi-million dollar businesses as integrator and then I did it as visionary. And making the change from integrator to visionary was so hard for exactly what you just said, Mike, because as an integrator, you win in check boxes. Like your results oriented, it's logistics and all of that. You go to visionary role and it's like you got one checkbox and it's just an unraveling yarn and you keep thinking about it. It keeps evolving and it's, it's harder to contain. So it's a, it just because you have time on your calendar doesn't mean you have mental capacity. And that has been such a, such a growth journey for me. The thing that you guys have done, even just explaining this is the courage to have what I call pink elephant conversations. It's the uncomfortable conversation that everyone knows there's a pink elephant in the room, but everyone is just tiptoeing around it. And it's really hard to build and scale organizations without having those because you forfeit trust. Every time you brush that thing under the rug, it it fragments the relationship. So how did you guys inside of your organization create a culture of having crucial conversations. I think it comes back to our values, right? So it's such a critical part of any business. I know that all the people listening probably do have values. And I hope that the values are more than just pretty pictures on the wall. Don't get me wrong. I love walking into an office building and see some awesome lettering or with your values tattooed all over it is super cool. But you also got to live up to them. And I was never really part of an agency or company that did that. Wong Duty did have values and they did say what they were, but I didn't feel them through the organization. And so I think when Mike and I started MKG, it was really important that when we created values, we really came back to living them. Every decision we make comes back to, is this people first? Is this transparent? Is this laddering up to the bigger picture? And is this upholding our standards that we've worked so hard to create thus far. And so transparency is one of our values and crucial conversations happen in that place of honesty of like, let's sit with the ugly truths of where we are and what's happening and then have a discussion around. I think IDS really helped with that. You know, what's the issue? Let's discuss it to really make sure we know it and understand it. And we've defined it because what you think the issue is is probably not what the actual issue is. Yeah. And then let's let's solve it. And yeah. so I think in really being able to embed IDS into our organization has really helped us have those pink elephant conversations a lot easier. It was it was mm-hmm. not pretty, you know, in the early days. It was very much ripping off a band-aid. It was very much saying hurtful things because we didn't know what else we yeah. didn't know how to just start the conversation. Yeah. And I think now that we use the IDS framework, it's really helped being able to have those conversations faster. And for folks who maybe don't know, IDS is issue, discuss, solve, and it's part of a weekly leadership meeting or every other week leadership meeting from EOS. One Mm -hmm. thing I'd say that, you know, Carrie, you just mentioned is 
and these are my words, but what you just mentioned brought this to, to the forefront of my mind is we didn't know how to have these conversations. So for the listeners, it's not like we just showed up and on our first day of partnership at being in a partnership in the business, we just knew how to have them. You know, I remember when Carrie came back from having the twins and I was, I was still in flight training every Friday morning. I'd go to San Carlos airport. It's just like five miles south of SFO in San Francisco. And we'd have our weekly meeting after I do a flight lesson uh, with an instructor. And I remember distinctly and in, in, in a horrible way, because I didn't have the, the language or any of the tools essentially saying like, I'm doing a whole lot around here and I don't know what the heck is going on with you, but like, I need help. And, and mm-hmm. Harry having two twins, you know, very young children for any listeners who have had young children, you know, like that first year and the first couple months is hard. And what you don't probably need someone to say is, Hey man, like what's going on with you? <laughs> and so I just said it in the most horrible way. I, I, it was, it was such a, it was a conversation that needed to happen, but it was it was from my side, just like delivered terribly. Mm-hmm. And now you fast forward, that's in 2015. It's now 2024. So we're almost a decade later. And we have tools that have been given to us like IDS mm-hmm. from the attraction or EOS framework. Mm-hmm. We've got, you know, a, a business coach who talks to us about mm-hmm. having crucial conversations and how to start conversations. So it's almost like training, right? Mm-hmm. Um, almost like a sport, right? Like nobody, nobody just gave Roger Feather a tennis racket and they were like, Hey man, go win like a pile of grand slams right? It it required like training and coaching and practice and some terrible, some terrible Mm matches, both in our business and in his tennis career Mm -hmm. to understand like, what's going on here? Like what's happening? And Mm -hmm. so it's that, that phrase of like, the only way out is through, like, Mm -hmm. you cannot go around this. Like that's avoiding the conversation. Like the the way forward is through and it's going to be messy and you're probably going to make some mistakes and insight is 2020, but Mm -hmm. ultimately it's it's having these tools to be able to have, in your words, you know, crucial conversations. Mm-hmm. That's also a book called Crucial Conversations, which is incredible if you, if you guys haven't read it. Okay. The thing that you also have done for each other is extend a lot of grace and also show a commitment. You know, it, sometimes when we reach those really hard moments in partnerships and a visionary integrator relationship can very much be like a, a marriage because you're committed to this person. You're working through everything with them. It's you're you're triggering each other. And so we have a process we call find your truth in the trigger, because what you're sharing is your narrative. It's your story. It's what you're telling yourself about the facts. But the root of it is something deeper. Like I'm feeling like this is inequitable or I am feeling like I am doing things I don't enjoy and you get to do all the things you do enjoy. And being able to share it from a place of, you know, we both want win-win, which it sounds like you guys have very much gone on that journey. The other part of the dynamic that I'm really curious about, and Carrie, you alluded it to it in the beginning which was, it was really just like a gut instinct. Like you knew it was your intuition and women, I think tend to have these visceral reactions. I think men do too, but women tend to be okay talking about it. And I know Carrie, you're a big Brene Brown fan as I am, I am too. And I'm sure you brought that into the culture and the leadership and dynamic, but has there been any wrestling with that Because I know I've had that where I've told my integrator, hey, this doesn't feel right. And unless it feels right and passionate and aligned, I don't think I can move in this direction. But someone who's an integrator, like who's more logical and systematic and if then and engineer thinking, it's like, this makes no sense. It's obvious we should do this. So how do you guys reconcile some of that if that happens in your relationship at all? I go off of hunches and gut feelings based off of facts and data from previous. Mm -hmm. So I am very much that logical thinker. I'm not takes that's why like, I'm not the visionary, I can't really think 10 steps ahead. I'm thinking about right now, and how to make right now great. And with, you know, really looking at that year to three year plan, like that's about as far as ahead as I can think. Mm -hmm. And so my gut reactions, my hunches are all based off of the information I'm gathering through my subconscious. And so I think when I met Mike, it was twofold. One, I saw, I saw me and him. I was that horse 
in New York. Mm. I, uh, I was owning the YoPlay account for $10 million and it was me. And I reported to a VP and mm. it burned me. So when I showed up at Cell Mike, I was like, I feel you so hard. <laughs> I can't <laughs> even tell you. Um, and what was magical about it, and you don't run into many of these people, especially in New York City, gosh, you do not run into these people in New York City, is that people who can take feedback mm. and run with it and lean into it and are mm. like, tell me, more. like, you're giving me great suggestions on what I could be doing better. Like, let's go. Right. And he was one of those people where I was like, we, we could grow together. Like, mm. we hear from each other. We build off of each other. It's rare that you find people to, to do that with where you don't get a, it's more of a, yes and versus a no but and so I think when we're for me it was very much like I was going on that gut feeling based off of all these past relationships that I had throughout New York Mm -hmm. so when I when I met Mike I I just that's how I knew it was based off of all that information and so I think for us moving forward, it it is very much where Mike can think a bit higher level. He can keep his pulse on the bigger picture. He can pull me up to say, I hear you. Like, you know, I know that this decision is really hard. I know that it might go against our values of what that feels like right now. But at the end of the day, this is what needs to be accomplished. And we need to, we need to find our way through and what that decision is going to be to get there. And so I, I, think we work really well that way of him Mm -hmm. being able to see big picture and me being like the right now problems of Mm -hmm. right now Mm -hmm. yeah i i would talk about you know to the listeners the having a framework and understanding what conversation we're having so like a piece of language that i have that i've had to change because my wife doesn't like this anymore and doesn't respond very uh, in a way that she likes to it is are we talking? Am I listening? Or are we solving something here? And you think about like a systems thinker, like an integrator can often be. And it's like the moment I say something as a visionary, an integrator will be like, well, let's see, like, how could we operationalize this? We can do this, that. And so framing it in a way of like, hey, I just want to, Carrie's going to laugh at this because I think my latest version is like, I just want to plant a seed, which I didn't realize I said that so often. And she actually reflected it back to me earlier this year. She's like, you, you plant a lot of seeds of thought and idea. And I'm like, I guess I do. I never thought about that. But that's basically saying, because mm-hmm. the language I used to use was, I'm going to tell you something, but I don't want to talk about it right now, which is like very frustrating to somebody who wants to operationalize something. And I, I, I think I said it last week. So I still say it on occasion, but it's like, I'm going to plant the seed of this idea and I also, I, I do my best to offer an outlet. So like every Thursday morning, we have a non-IDS meeting, just Carrie and I, not our, our leadership team. It's just the two of us for 50 minutes. And so I often will plant seeds at the beginning of the week so Carrie can think about them and then we can have time to talk about them. And, and we, we might just jump straight into operationalizing it. That non-IDS block of time ter- turns into IDS real quick sometimes. But it's framing it of like, here's how I'm bringing this to you. And for me, like how I felt like, like right in here sometimes is I'd like bring this idea to Carrie and then she'd start operationalizing it. And I'd be like, I don't know, like, I don't think we're even ready for that or whatever. And so it's kind of like, you know, you put the car in drive and then you like put it back in park. And so everyone's just like, what are we doing here, guys? Like, what the heck? But it, it's not everyone. It's two people yes. being like, what the heck is happening around here? So I'm trying to find that, like that language and that framing of, here, I'm just going to like share some ideas and I'm not sure that I'm ready. That can also be another piece of language of like, I'm not sure I'm ready. Like I'm here to listen if you want to talk about it, but I'm not really ready to go further right now. I can listen, but I don't know that I can contribute as a speaker right now. One of the things I learned so much about the visionary integrator dynamic, which you guys are modeling here, is the, the need for thought partnership. And with it not necessarily being actionable, because I know my integrator comes to me and says, well, what do you think about all of this? And there, and I'm like, that's so in the weeds. Like, I, I can't go there right now. But at the same time, they're coming because they're like, I want to make sure that the vision is fully represented operationally. And I want to just double check and make sure we're aligned. And then when I'm in the visionary role, 
I'm like, hey, could we actually operationalize this? Would this actually resonate with our customers? I need like boots on the ground insight into this. And that thought partnership, I didn't realize until more recently how critical that was for visionary integrator relationships to be successful. So framing it instead of chasing multiple rabbits is so critical, yet sometimes we don't self-regulate in that fashion, especially I'll say more in the visionary seat than the integrator. The integrators tends to be more like three to five years right in front of you, more disciplined with their thinking. Visionaries in the seat, that seat, we didn't get lost in the clouds and sometimes lose, lose sense of reality or, or practicality at times. And the integrator can feel like they're poking holes in it. So Carrie, do you have tactics that you use to support Mike in thought partnership without him feeling like his ideas are being dismissed or poo-pooed? It took me a really long time to give space, to, to give space to an idea and let my subconscious hang out. So it's the, it's the giving space. Giving space for your subconscious to marinate on an idea. And I feel like that put it in a box really well because sometimes we take an idea, it's in the integrator seat, especially take the idea and run with it. I don't need to, I don't need to integrate every single idea he has all the time. <laughs> sometimes he just has ideas and he needs to say them and I need to give him space to say them. Let my mm -hmm. subconscious hang out with them. And then there's going to be one or two that I say, okay, I see it. I got to see, I call them lily pads, right? So like, I don't want to not say no to an idea. I just can't quite see the lily pads yet. So mm -hmm. my subconscious is going to hang out with it. And then the minute I can see the lily pads, it's the minute I'm like, okay, let's dig into this and figure out what this means and how this mm -hmm. might impact the company in a bigger way. So it's those, it's those two things between the, the giving of the space and, and acknowledging to myself that I don't, I don't need to integrate every idea. He's, he's going to have a million ideas. That's his job. Mm -hmm. It's my job to figure out which ideas are the ones we can use right now. Yeah. One of the integrators I know will ask the visionary, okay, of the five ideas you just told me about, which one of these are you going to change your mind about tomorrow? And then they just start one. going down their fingers. And I'm like, that's brilliant. I need to use that. <laughs> so what are you guys most excited about? Now that your visionary integrator relationship is just stormed and formed and you're really getting each other, that's where magic happens. So what's the future hold? I think it took us a minute to get acclimated. So a couple things happened, right? So I took over CEO. The importance of me taking the CEO seat and really sitting in the integrator as one person versus splitting is that now one person can see all the different pillars of the organization and how they fit together. Before Mike was sales and finance and he saw that and I was like, cool, I'm just gonna go ask for money whenever I need it from a marketing and operations standpoint. Mm -hmm. But we weren't, because we weren't working together, there wasn't one person who could see the through line on that, mm -hmm. then we got we got out of balance. Mm -hmm. And so I, it really took me probably the last two years to really be able to see the full organization and how these all these pillars work, look at the historical data, and and think about how the market has changed and then what we're going to do from here based off of that information. And I finally feel like I get it. <laughs> it's ever changing and I'm, I'm, I, you know, but I, I feel caught up. Mm -hmm. And so I think it took us the, the last two years. We also, I mean, I, I think a lot of agencies are feeling this up and down in terms of how the market's operating. And it's been a tough two years. So we've been in a bit of fight or flight, but we're coming out the other side 2024 has, you know, has set us up for success in terms of where we are in trajectory of our finances. And so I think we're in a really good spot now to like give Mike those wings and that breath mm -hmm. to like go really live in that visionary role. We haven't really had a chance to give him that. And he's mm -hmm. starting to find his feet in it. And it's, it's, it's exciting to think about now that we have the space to think about it. Mm -hmm. uh, he has the space to think about it. <laughs> Yeah, you know where we're going from a visionary standpoint. Somebody wise told me, when you want to be going somewhere, you have to know where you're starting from, right? Like there always has to be like us. You you are here button on your map, and I think where we are today, where we have been, is focused on primarily 
running a, a traditional agency model. And there's nothing wrong with it being traditional in the agency model. It's, it's great, been great for us over the past 12 years. And where I see us going is behaving differently than a traditional agency. So like a traditional agency, you know, you, you do some marketing and selling and then you get a client and then you sign them and then they pay you and then you do the work and on occasion you churn a few and you bring a few more in and it, it's fine, right? There's nothing wrong with that. But where I am thinking from a vision standpoint is we need some sort of compounding, it's compounding effect to make the business compound. So it's not just linear. It's not just one and one is two. It's one and one can become 50. Um, and that's where I see us going is behaving a little bit less an advertising or a marketing agency and more like a group of specialists. So like a great example that I gave to Carrie the other day is like, if we're a building, like in a, a condo building, we have as an agency, and I know we'll, we'll tell your listeners at the end, kind of what we do and who we work with. Um, we have a specific focus in terms of services and the type of customer we want to work with. And that's great. It's really, you know, solid positioning. It helps people. It, it's magnetic, right? It draws certain people in and it repels others. Um, but there are certain things we don't do that are other capabilities we'd love to have. And so I see for our vision, this condo building of individual condo units of specialties. Mm -hmm. And what gets lost a lot, I was just talking to somebody two weeks ago who's selling his marketing agency. And what gets lost a lot in an acquisition, as one example, is you get folded into the mothership. Mm -hmm. And the thing that made you special, that made you valuable, that people acquired you for, that people wanted to work at and mm -hmm. people wanted to hire, it kind of, kind of becomes like glazed over into like one big mothership mm -hmm. for him. And so like our vision that I see, and it's taken a long time to get to this vision is the condo building with these individual condo units of specialization. Cause that's where we really think that's where the compounding benefits will come is a diverse set of capabilities, but not mushed together into one mothership. And they're all mm -hmm. specialized and they're all focused on our audience of software and cybersecurity marketers. And so that's, mm -hmm. that's where I see us going. And it's been really exciting to get there and, it's actually good timing to record this because we literally just got there in the past few weeks. Like this is very new to us. Yeah. I think that's like having a, an umbrella organization with silos that are specialized is so helpful, especially in service-based businesses, because it's so nuanced per customer that you're working with. And then you can have underneath all of your software tech platforms, your tech stack that you either have in-house or affiliates, and then that becomes such a great model with your services being very boutique and custom and tailored, and the software is the part that scales it for you. So I love that structure. How would you guys define success? Not business, but individually. I know you guys did your yeah, I think I would call it an MOU, but Carrie, you called it some formation agreement. This is what we're doing. What does that look like for you when this is all said and done? What does success look like to me? So first of all, I don't see MKG as something that will be done. I see it as something that probably I will perish. But my, my vision is I will perish before the organization does in whatever format the organization is at that time. Um, so it's just this constant state of, of, of evolution. And I haven't done it this year, but actually this time last year, I wrote myself an email of what does MKG do for me? And it really was some of the things that you just asked about, like what does success look like? So success to me looks like flexibility and work location and time. Success looks like being able to travel for work, but not having to travel for work. Success looks like being able to volunteer, which I'm trying to get back into. And it's kind of been slow going since COVID, you know, everything kind of shut down in person. I, I really enjoy like in-person volunteering. And success to me also looks like, or I'll tell you what it doesn't look like. There isn't a number that I have. You know, a lot of entrepreneurs have a number. Like if you're a 4% rural person, you're like, I just need to make $10 million and then I can live on my brokerage account for the rest of my life and not have to do anything, which is all well and good until you meet somebody who's made $10 million and they are living a 4% life. And they're like, dude, I'm so bored. <laughs> like, I am like, I'm literally like punching holes in the wall. So I have something to do during the day. So I can like do drywall work. Like I'm floating drywall just because I've got nothing else to do around here. So what it doesn't look like is for me, it's not a number for me. It doesn't really have an end 
And I think coming back to, you know, talking about the holding company and, and the condo building and the units within it, it's this evolution of what the offering is mm-hmm. at, here at MKG. Like MKG could be the overarching condo building. That's, that's what's on the building, you know, the sign. There's all these little condo units within it. And that evolution will have to be flexible because we don't even know what we're going to, what we're going to need in 10 years, right? Mm-hmm. Like I don't even know what condo units are going to be in that building at that point. Right. It could be the same. It could be different. It could be a mix. So like for me, I look at it as, you know, maximum flexibility. It's not about a number. It's more about a lifestyle without it being a lifestyle business, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. I, what I'm hearing, and I think I've hear, heard it almost throughout this whole conversation is just, it's almost a value of joy, like enjoying the process, enjoying the discovery, enjoying envisioning, enjoying the evolution, enjoying learning how to have crucial conversations. I, it's the process. That's such a beautiful way to approach it. Yeah, very John Wooden-esque when you frame it that way of like, it's not about what's the scoreboard, it's about how you tie your shoes, it's about how you run, it's, how you, yes. it's about like, it's about the process. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How about for you, Carrie? I'm with Mike. We read the book by Simon Snack of, I'll start with why it was the, the infinite game, the infinite game. And so in reading that book, that's where it came for me of like, this is a painting that's never going to be done. And I'm mm-hmm. going to sit and accept that and, and be excited about what this could mean for the next generation of who will take this thing over and keep it going. That's Mm -hmm. super exciting for me that I think that's what success looks like. The idea of it continuing without Mike or I need and sort of our legacy. I called it a legacy the other day and my husband was like, like this been doing this for 12 years. Like I don't see myself really doing anything else. So yeah, my kids are going to remember my career Mm -hmm. as MKG and the legacy I leave behind for the next Mm -hmm. generation to take it over. And so, yeah, I think for me, it's right now in terms of success, I'm looking for that stability and sustainability piece for it to grow into that, that legacy. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. You guys are finding your eyes closed reasons for doing eyes open things that are beyond your time on earth, which is beautiful. I love it. So if folks want to learn more about what you do, maybe can you all share a little bit about that and then where people can connect with you? Certainly. So we're easy to find online. The company is called MKG Marketing, Mike Kilo Golf Marketing. And you can go to mkg.marketing. Just type that into your, your browser and it'll take you straight to our website. Carrie and I are also both power LinkedIners. So I think probably in the show notes, we can hook Stacy up with our LinkedIn profiles. We would love for anybody to connect with us who heard the episode, wants to talk about anything we discussed or anything we left out. That's really, you know, the easiest way to get a hold of us is hit the website, hit us on LinkedIn. And if you are, you know, a software or a cybersecurity marketer listening to this, that's, that's our niche. Like that's where MKG works. So we would absolutely love to meet you. If there's an opportunity to work together, great. But more importantly, just to expand our network and our, on our world. Harry, anything that I left out there? If you are looking for marketing tips and tricks, we do have a podcast, Tea Time with Tech Marketing Leaders, that I host. Um, so many great demand gen marketers on there who are building businesses and have great ideas on how to help you do it. So definitely check check that out. And if you're a marketer in B2B, in the tech space, in SaaS or cyber, and you want to be on the show, let me know. Love yeah. to have you. Love that. You, I don't know why anyone would not want to connect with you both because you are soulful leaders. And I feel like the world is really needing a lot more soulful leaders and bringing bringing more joy into the workplace while you get things done. Because like Mike, you said, the guy who retired 4%, you, you get bored. People want to do things because that makes them feel significant and valuable. And that creates more beautiful things in the world. So I just appreciate both of you and admire the visionary integrator relationship between those platforms and the business that you guys are building. So thank you so much for joining conversation today. Thank you, Stacy. Thanks for having us. Yes. Yeah, thank you.